Hello, and welcome to this curriculum series specifically about NP Advanced Pharmacology curriculum support integration into your program. I'm Dr. Bustai, and this is part three, where we are going to explain and show you ways that you can practically implement the new AACN Essentials core document and competencies as it relates to this specific topic throughout the NP curriculum. Okay. We are going to make it easy. We've been doing this for years. And if you just follow along, you're, we're going to cover some of the practical issues that you have to deal with. But we're also going to show you how it can be done because we are actively doing it already with our partnering institutions. Okay. Now, if you have not listened to part one or part two, I really encourage you to pause right here and listen to those because this topic obviously builds on the why does this matter? How do we design it? Why does it need to be integrated this way? Where is it coming from? Okay. So if you skipped over those parts, I really encourage you to listen to those briefly because it will make sense of how this is being implemented and why we are encouraging this process. And we as a company are partnering with institutions to make this easy for you because we know it is difficult and you sometimes do need help supporting the process and doing it in a way that can be maintained, okay? So the high yield model for curriculum support aligns and has aligned with the 2021 AACN report that came out, okay? We loved it because we were like, that's what we do already encourage our programs, not just in nursing, but also pharmacy and medicine because as a company, we service a lot of professions, but this is a model that we've embraced. We are about teaching people to understand why they do what they do. And a lot of times that requires a more comprehensive, integrated and longitudinal approach to do it because content builds on itself in a learner specific or tiered based format. And it has to build in some evidence so that people really understand things in the proper context of evidence so that it's applied appropriately. Now, trying to do this and considering the three P's, right? When we talk about three P's, we're talking about not only advanced pharmacology, but pathophysiology and physiology. And then we have obviously physical assessment and examination and these things. Those traditional models don't go away. They're still there. They're still part of the essentials, in fact. So you don't have to think about them as you know dissolved. And this is not actually that difficult, but there are practical things when you're trying to integrate this across an entire curriculum and for it to be built upon. That means that the information has to also be strategically built upon and people can follow it, right? That's not just the student, but it's also the faculty in the program when they undergo through accreditation have to be able to show where is this information being distributed? And how is it cohesive? Again, we make that easy because our curriculum does that. Okay. So the obvious challenges it, many times to a program is that you have more than one faculty and each of those faculty typically have their own courses that they teach and they don't get involved in sometimes other courses depending on the program. So it becomes difficult to take what somebody taught in one class and continue to integrate it into other courses, especially as you transition into those clinical rotations where everything is supposed to be starting to come together from the didactic courses where we're applying it to real patients, okay? So you have more than one faculty. You have coordination of schedules, not just the schedule of the faculty, but schedules of students. We know that a lot of programs, <clears throat> everybody's different, but some programs where students can go through the training based on their life, personal lives, their, their work schedules. And so it may not always fit. So they've got to be able to plug in and continue on wherever they are at in the process of that degree and program, okay? That's a challenge, okay? The availability of faculty who have the expertise to do all of that and to make sure that it's being done throughout the entire curriculum in a longitudinal comprehensive manner. So those are real challenges that schools and programs have, but they're the expectations of the stakeholders, the students, right? And the public in particular, but also now new standards. 
So we have to find a way of doing it. So the high yield solution, which we've been doing for years again, and even helping current MP programs to do, is that we have, we build in pathophysiology even into our lectures. We build in some physical assessment, clinical presentation and signs and symptoms and all that strategically because a lot of times when we're implementing a treatment, we are trying to target those things and improve those things. But you gotta understand them in their proper context while you're learning the treatments, don't you? So our curriculum and our material that integrates into programs does that very strategically on purpose. But it also does it in a, offers an option of a tiered based solution. So you still teach the core content because students have to learn it. Okay, you gotta learn the practical information, but then we take it to the next level of disease state reviews and therapeutic reviews, case-based reviews where you apply it. You put it in the context of the disease while you are gaining that experience where it all starts to come together, right? We've all been there, we've seen that, but we've also got to build in the evidence strategically without overwhelming the students and the faculty. We have to teach it in the proper context. That means you have to distill it down and make it easy to understand and apply. Now, if you need case-based reviews, which we think are very helpful, we offer those, but they can be integrated so that people learn how to take a case scenario and work through it and apply what they learned in their advanced pharmacology course and what they're seeing in their clinical environment, depending on what they're doing, right? And seeing how it applies, how it fits, why does it work that way? And so it builds strategically. So again, whether they come in different times, they can merge right back into where they are and what they've learned in the past. So we have our preclinical coursework, which still exists. And then we have our clinical coursework where we have our rotations. And think of it as clinical rotation support, like a textbook, if you will, <clears throat> for while you're on rotation. You're going to see these diseases and this rotation. You better know those. And this is relevant also, not just for one student, but all of the students in a program. Because we all know that if they go to one rotation site over another, they may get different experiences. And that inconsistency creates problems, right? Because not everybody's graduating with the same level of knowledge. So let's take a step back and let's talk a little bit about tiered-based education and why it matters, okay? Because if you're gonna do it longitudinally, it has to build strategically. We use a process called knowledge transfer as part of our model. It's the basis for how we put our curriculums together. We know that people learn it at a very basic level first. That's our explicit knowledge down here, right? Then they build and they go to the tacit knowledge, which is that depth, the why. Do you understand why you do what you do? Can you articulate to me and explain to me? This is where that competency in clinical application really starts to come in. And then of course, the clinical application in the real world environment is where it matters because there's a patient on the other end of that decision, isn't there? Right, it's not just a test, it's not just a class grade. There's a patient at the end of all of this that's gonna be impacted. And so how would that look for advanced pharmacology? Again, let's start drilling it down and be a little bit more objective than talking philosophical, okay? Because I know that's where you're at. So when we look at this diagram, I like this infographic, obviously we created it, but, but I like it because it conceptualizes the, the way we approach training, right? We have the didactic courses, that's at preclinical, and then we have our clinical, and then we've been talking about in our three-part series, building on those longitudinal integrated components, okay? And you might, your program might not need all three, that's okay. Our system can be adjusted to allow for you to choose what you need at some level. We have a program that we encourage, but to do this right, you really kind of need all three. Now you can deliver those obviously through the faculty at some level, or you can partner with a company like High Yield Med Reviews that will come in and help you do components of it to make that part easy so that you can focus on other things like maybe the case-based reviews, for example, or papers or different things in case discussions. Right, because we all know that part is important too at a practical local level. Okay, so phase one, which is that preclinical work, that is that explicit knowledge where you're learning facts, but you're starting, especially in the graduate level training, to merge into that depth, the understanding of why, that tacit level knowledge. 
Okay, so that's that integrated tiered based allows a longitudinal growth. And then phase two in your clinical environment is where we go from the tacit knowledge really to applying. And that all matters because again, we want everybody to be consistently doing that through the program. You're expected to show that. And number two, there's a patient at the end of our decision. And when we think about the new standards, they're talking about moving from time-based competency assessments to competency-based education where you need to actually demonstrate that you know how to do it, which is the right thing to do, isn't it? Okay, so our preclinical phase one, right, work curriculum, it still exists, right? You have to take physical exam, physical assessment. You need to know basic physiology and pathophysiology, which is why many times they are kind of prerequisites to advanced pharmacology. But when you look at advanced pharmacology and its expansion and the components over the years, you see all these components now being shoved into these courses. Well, it's hard to teach all that at once. Does it need to all be taught in one semester? No, again, a longitudinal, comprehensive, integrated approach allows all those components to be built in, especially if your curriculum that you're using allows you and is built around that same model, okay? And then there are the opportunity, obviously, for case-based reviews if you need that. Your program may already do that very well. You may not need that. That's okay. You don't have to plug that piece in, but you might still need the advanced pharmacology course. So we have curriculum for the course itself, and that course can stand alone if it needs to, and that's all you need, okay? So we can help you in the pre phase one preclinical, and that's all you need. But if you want to really do it in a longitudinal, integrative, comprehensive manner, then we have what is the phase two part, which is that really than the clinical, the tacit to the clinical application, okay? So think of it as a textbook or curriculum support for your rotations. So you, we all know that they go to every rotation and each rotation sometimes exposes the student to different things. The preceptor's level of interest in teaching influences it. Their experience also influences it. The types of patients they're interacting with influences what that student is going to get out of that rotation, okay? And so when we think about a core curriculum, the idea behind that is really to provide some consistency, right? <clears throat> so we, because why? Because they have to demonstrate, you have to show that they are competent now. So instead of just saying, oh, they, they, did, the, they did their, pay their time and their dues, they're done, they know it. To know, they actually have to show that they know it. So there are options to doing optional with our program, end of rotation exams. Well, our curriculum has that if you need it. So if you want to objectively assess, because that's part of curriculum development implementation, isn't it? If you want to objectively assess, did they get certain things? Did they learn certain things? And is it consistent amongst the program for no matter where they go? And they're using a curriculum that helps support them while they're on the rotations? Then we offer that. Okay, you can do that. That's why it's considered optional. Think of the flipped classroom, because you're like, okay, that sounds great, but how do you do it? What is the flipped classroom? Well, that's going on outside of the classroom environment or the rotation itself. Well, I mean, that either is, if you're in the, if you're in the clinical environment, the, the preceptor is gonna have to do topic discussions or spend time pausing at a case in a, in a patient scenario and explaining things if they can and have the time to do it. But sometimes they don't. The practical issue of time is just there. So giving them something that does the topic review for them and they know, go listen to this lecture. Okay, study that particular thing and we'll discuss it when we see the next case. Okay, then we help the preceptor so they don't have to carry the burden of doing everything and keeping everything maintained and up to date. We also build in the evidence-based practice into that. Okay, so that they are learning the evidence in its proper context. So the why and the how of what you do. And then building in things like cases, you know, and how do you apply it, special population scenarios that sometimes you may not see in a typical experience and you just get lucky, right? These can then bleed over and, consider and be integrated into OSCEs and SIM centers and other things. Our curriculum feeds right into that and builds on it. So why mainly are we advocating a flipped classroom or self-directed learning? Well, because a lot of learners now are that way, aren't they? 
They watch things on in the internet. They learn by listening. They listen to podcasts, all this stuff. So traditional textbooks have slowly gone on the decline, right? That doesn't mean they're irrelevant. They're still very important. And there needs to be an element of that. But there are practical resources out there where decision makers like you are struggling with, well, where do I get that information? How do I put that together? I don't have time to develop all that. Again, that's where high yield med reviews comes into play. We can partner with you and give you and your students access to that information or the students can purchase access to that information on their own, right? Because we know that the preceptor's demands are high. You want to be able to provide consistency across the curriculum and show it to an accreditation body. Okay, and we use this is a model that's also already done by other profession. So when you think about it, you put, plug in the course Advanced Pharmacology, which we have. We also have evidence based medicine reviews and biostatistics and that stuff if you need it. But then you also have clinical rotation support. Just think of it as another textbook for the rotations, but you can assign them topics or we already know what core topics are in those areas. Why does that matter? Well, because the AACN document says that you need to do that. It needs to be more consistent among the graduates. They want to see that and the graduates are expecting it as well. So we go from this old way of teaching in a confined course thinking it's time-based competency to a more integrated, comprehensive, longitudinal perspective. Now, why was that arrow pointing forward? Because learning in the pursuit of clinical excellence really doesn't ever end, does it? We learn a lot and many times we learn most of our stuff after it, but we gotta have a foundation where we go from learning things and where we're learning the best available evidence, we're gaining that clinical expertise, we're considering patient matter, but our education builds some of that foundation where we started out down here, guys, at the beginning of this series, but we have ended at the top together Okay? And that's how we view ourselves. We are a partner to make this easy to do, integrated into your current curriculum right now in any format that you need for your classes, phase one, phase two, both. Okay, If you need to phase it in at a certain order, you can do it that way. It works best in integrating both across the process though which is also what the standards are saying. So we've got a three year implementation when it came out in 2021. Well, that's coming around on the corner. So it's eminent. You can't ignore it much further. It's also important because change is necessary to move the profession forward, but keep it relevant. If you don't invest in the profession, it will start to be taken away, isn't it? So let's get started. We've been doing this for 10 years. We'll make it easy for you. You can build it into the curriculum where the school could purchase it or even the students can purchase it as part of their textbooks and you know that are required or recommended if you want to learn more email us okay or scan in this qr code we're happy to show you how it looks we're give you a sample account show you what it how to do it we have other schools that are already doing it okay and so our goal is is to make it easy as you can tell we are passionate about doing this because it fits our model. We've been doing it that way for years. And so when this came out, we were like, we agree. So let's, let's partner with the institutions and help you guys achieve this goal.